Uh, who knows, maybe like if this goes online, we would maybe like start it here or something. So let's just say, um, I guess, welcome people to this uh, little meeting. Uh, we hope that it will be the first of some uh, in order to explore uh, the question of temperature of the earth and some dangers that we are uh, feeling and knowing. Uh, in future for the planet. And therefore we are interested in the question of geoengineering in order to materially, rationally find solutions so that we don't, um, so that we actually take something in hand. So this is the first of perhaps a, a few uh, uh, videos or interviews, let's say. And um, this one uh, is uh, attended by me and um, Bud Blumenthal from Brussels. Uh, there was also Roger Hallam uh, from, are you in London, Roger? Yeah, yeah. London from, yeah. And Ye Tao, who is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So we're on these different uh, places and each of us will do a little introduction right now before we get into the subject. Uh, a real short introduction about myself. Um, I'm, uh, you know, well over 50 years. I'm in my 60s. Uh, I've been an artist, a dance artist for the last 35 years, making choreography and making performances with technology and dance and projects like that throughout Europe. Um, I've been living here for 35 years. <clears throat> and um, uh, my art my art has collapsed in the last couple of years because the last couple of years I realize the the danger that we are in um in our worlds uh i think uh i think i i i got it through paul beckwith who is a great canadian um uh person very very interested and very very strong in weather and climate and science and uh that led me to a guy mcpherson and when you go through those two people, you, you, you definitely go straight into the heart of the problem. And after that, it's very difficult to, to see the world in a normal way. Um, in uh, now, uh, for the last few years, I've been pretty much a walking zombie. And the artist's side of me has collapsed. And I went to, uh, as a refuge, not as a refuge, but as some sort of way um, I found Extinction Rebellion when it was just starting up here in Brussels um, and was able to get into it just in the very beginning moment. This, this uh, incredible international project of activism to try to save our, ourselves that Roger initiated a couple of years ago, if I'm not, probably more now. Um, here's the symbol, in fact, there you saw it. Um, Anyway, this has been very a major, this is activism has replaced the artistic side because as a dancer, I had a nightmare imagining my children selling to asking me some years down the road, father, what were you doing when everything was collapsing around us? And this honest answer would have been uh, children, I was dancing. And this has haunted me, so I, could not help but stop dancing and now applying myself to the question and how I can hopefully save this world so that maybe my children will be able to continue to dance or maybe me too but so we don't we're not forced to stop dancing like I am now so that's all I want to say about myself at the moment and um, now perhaps we should uh, pass it on to Roger so he can talk a little bit about about him. <laughs> Thanks so much, Bud. Yeah, well, it's been really great getting to know you, Bud, and I really appreciate you helping to get this meeting together. And I really appreciate you, yay, um, yay, ye, yo, something like that, <laughs> um, you know, being on the call. And I feel very, uh, you know, appreciative that you've given us the time because I'm sure you're very busy and it sounds like you're doing something really amazing. So thank you so much. And um, in, in terms of myself, um, um, I've been involved in political change work since I was 15, 35 years of it. I'm very social movements. That's really what I do as my life's work. And uh, but I 
towards the sort of gave up for the middle half of my life because not much was happening. <laughs> so I, I was an organic farmer for 20 years and been in business and what have you. And I have a sort of practical orientation that I brought to the founding Extinction Rebellion. But uh, in the mid 2000s, there was a number of, uh, well, it was in the mid 2000s that extreme weather events started happening on a regular basis as in many other parts of the world. So um, my, my business was subjected to several one in a thousand year events like many of the you know, billions of farmers around the world. So it's all been uh, uh, you know, on the front line, to, you know, literally on the front line for uh, the farming business that I was doing growing vegetables. So the long, long story is that I decided to go back into academia, which was my first love really. And uh, I did an, a master's in Swansea and I've been at, in King's College at London um, doing PhD research in civil disobedience and, and the dynamics of mobilization and critical change. And um, for the last three years, I've been involved in Extinction Rebellion and um, mainly on the sort of strategic uh, the strategic side, physical design, but also on messaging, I suppose. Um, and I'm at the moment involved in creating a sort of global anti-political party called Burning Pink, which will hopefully get to power and save the world. <laughs> so no shortage of ambition there. But um, and I suppose I just want to make a few comments about the climate movement and you know, the whole area of technical solutions. I'm not sure what the generic phrase for it is, but, you know, maybe it's called geoengineering, but maybe that's too specific. But there is a sort of, a, a sort of classic moral hazard sort of conundrum in, in the space that if, if you start saying, oh, we can sort this out by, you know, someone doing X, Y, and Z to the atmosphere, then everyone relaxes and continues to put carbon into the atmosphere. But the other side of the moral hazard is if everyone goes, oh, you know, we can we can sort this out by just putting carbon emissions and then they find out that that physiologically isn't the case, then we sort of, we have to pretend that the world's going to end, there's nothing we can do about it. So there's a little bit of a tension, as you might say, in an Extinction Rebellion, Extinction Rebellion isn't really set up to create the solutions, as you probably know, it's set up to create the space through which the solutions can be created, which is quite a different idea. It's there to create citizens assemblies. So, you know, people like you, Ye, and other experts can go to them and say, guys, this is what you've got to do. And instead of having to talk to fossil fuel sort of captured politicians, you, you've got, you know, reasonable, ordinary people who will listen to a good idea and they think it's good, then you know, Citizens Assembly will enact uh, geoengineering, which I think we've all agreed is part of the solution and quite possibly the main part of the solution, depending on how you see the science. So, you know, what this is a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a interesting <laughs> new approach <laughs> that me and Bud have been talking about. And I think, uh, I think we need to be sort of sensitive to that moral hazard issue uh, but at the same time, I think we have a, a, a total responsibility to look at the science and suggest that, that geoengineering and other uh, activities, if they're going to work and if they have to work, they need to be part of the solution. And, um, and that's for us to investigate. And we have to trust ourselves enough to investigate that without falling into the idea that we can continue you know, destroying nature and try and get something to clear it off afterwards. Uh, so, you know, that's where I'm coming from. So I'm very, you know, very interested in, in your views. And I think potentially we're looking at putting our finger in the water by interviewing you or having some video with you and, um, you know, and, and see where that adventure leads, really. That's how I look upon it. I always look upon life as a bit of a, you know, I'm a great risk taker. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I get myself into trouble but I'm always uh, you know if something looks scary let's do it <laughs> but um yeah so I'll hand over to you and yeah thanks again for you know taking the time out to speak to us thank you
Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks, Roger. Thanks, uh, Bud, for uh, introducing yourselves and for uh, reaching out. Uh, it's an honor to you know talk to you guys. And uh, given, of course, uh, Roger, you're very prominent uh, in the news. So everybody, most people who watch the news, even mainstream news, uh, probably uh, know who you are. Oh, so right, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's all lies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Anyway, so uh, so I'm uh, uh, in my mid thirties. Uh, I'm turning thirty five uh, in the summer this year. Um, so I'm quite a young person, um, and uh, I've been uh, in the the field of science for about two decades. I sort of started early as a child back in Montreal, just you know picking up the textbooks and somehow fell in love with uh, uh, of my first encounter with the physics. Uh, college physics textbook. And, um, and during high school, I um, uh, really then fell in love with uh, chemistry and uh, represented Canada at uh, uh, the 36th uh, International Chemistry Olympiad uh, in uh, 2004, that was in, in Germany. So, um, and I did pretty well during the competitions and that's how I knew that uh, I'm probably like cut out to become a scientist. So um, then I went to, to college and majored in uh, chemistry uh, physical chemistry and biochemistry. So I got a, a taste of how, you know, life works, the molecules of life and uh, constraints on on that and also the fundamental chemical uh, principles uh, of how things are made, how uh, things transform from one form to another and how uh, energy has to be uh, input uh, in that process. Why we always have uh, the coupling of both material transformation and energy consumption or dissipation. So those two have to happen together. And then, um, so during my undergraduate career, I was very interested in understanding how things worked. So my project for my undergrad thesis was to uh, understand at the molecular detail, like how a particular reaction happened, how molecule A, B, C, D, E came together to interact and what are the steps of the interaction that leads to a particular outcome. So um, that sort of suggested that I'm intrinsically uh, somehow drawn to unearth uh, the es essence or underlying mechanisms of, uh, you know, at that time, uh, small scale molecular processes. So when I went to uh, grad school uh, at MIT, I was really drawn then to a new uh, instrument or technique, which would allow you to take uh, pictures, snapshots of uh, tiny particles of, of matter, but with high resolution, uh, atomic resolution in three dimensions. That would be like a game changer, for example, in the field of uh, nanotechnology and even in drug development, if you can capture uh, the conformation of antibodies uh, binding to, to their antigens or drug target complexes. So you would have a you know, broad range of uh, applications, but underlying that sort of instrument is the basic principle that to solve any engineering problem, if you understand the core principles, uh, it will allow you to uh, really uh, navigate uh, and design different uh, uh, strategies to achieve your particular engineering goal. Um, so I became an experimental physicist during grad school, learning how to um, design vacuum instruments, how to make uh, computer chips, for example, uh, like uh, the, the range of uh, uh, clean room fabrication, nanofabrication technology that underlies much of a modern technology, how to make tiny things, uh, exploiting uh, uh, the chemical reactions that we know, the different plasma phases and uh, the physics. Uh, so that was my training. And after I graduated in the, uh, you know, five, six years ago, I um, took a position here at Roland originally to continue the original line of work to develop this uh, fantastic uh, microscope. Um, but then uh, very soon after I, I joined in, in 2016, it became apparent to me that uh, there wouldn't be much of a world in which to apply such a microscope uh, in the coming decades uh, if we were to stay on the current, current course. So it's probably a uh, high time to rethink uh, how to use my training uh, as a uh, just incidentally, a multidisciplinary uh, scientific engineer to see whether there is a, a different way to tackle the climate crisis, which clearly isn't being addressed properly. Um, so the more I read into um, related fields, including people working at the forefront of renewable energies, um, uh, it, it's, it's quite clear that uh, the current paradigm are not uh, really addressing uh, the core of the problem. There's a disconnect between the engineering field and the climate science 
people. Um, and so the different groups are really not talking to each other and not really knowing uh, the fundamentals of how the climate the earth system will evolve basically pre prevents the engineers who are excellent at what they do from even starting with the right, asking the right questions, let alone address the right problems. So um, I guess uh, realizing that I saw, uh, you know, after like maybe two years of uh, deep uh, depression, like most pe people who have realized uh, uh, the future you know, trajectory of our system, uh, it uh, dawned on me that there's a huge opportunity uh, to at least bring a different perspective um, to the people, to, to the academic world at least, uh, so we can maybe set humanity on the right course. So that's how um, I got into the field of uh, uh, climate uh, mitigation engineering. So Roger mentioned uh, uh, the important issue of moral hazard and also but uh, introduced uh, this in, uh, uh, conversation as uh, something about geoengineering. I would like to um, really make the point that uh, the project that we're pursuing right now uh, is much more than the traditional geoengineering. I think a better term for our project is uh, adaptive mitigation. And it's also very important to uh, mention that uh, uh, traditional geoengineering or the adaptive mitigation framework we're proposing uh, are only tools to help humanity transition to the hopefully a next phase where we are no longer you know leaving a lot of our trash unattended to uh, in uh, scientific terms it's like if we leave uh, many cycles uh, by a geo uh, biochemical cycles open then we would lead to accumulation of waste at certain point and that obviously is not sustainable because it will continue to grow and eventually will overwhelm the system. Well, so, the, yeah, so what we're trying to do is to um, first analyze where the cycles are broken and how can we close those cycles so that they are closed cycles where the flux is constant everywhere, powered by renewable energy. Um, obviously, human society is very complex. There are many uh, cycles that one can, one can think of, like the nitrogen cycle that's involved, you know, in generated from combustion, for example, NOx emissions being one. There's also the Haber-Bosch process for making urea and, uh, uh, and ammonia process for fertilization. Those are all, you know, different parts of the nitrogen cycle and also pollution of rivers and also uh, of the ocean. And of course, they're also essential for microbe and the primary production. So the question is, how do we take into account uh, all the different processes uh, on the human side and also on the ecosystem side? How can we mesh them together into a steady state where the flux of the material is constant in time at every location? So um, uh, the sort of uh, flux uh, or uh, uh, cycle closure engineering uh, is a one uh, central uh, paradigm that we're trying to pursue in our uh, research. Yeah, is, the, is that more central than the thermal idea? The idea- You're a bit quiet, uh, by the way, but- Pardon? Uh, the, uh, You're a bit quiet. I'm quiet? Yeah. Oh, you, you mean, were before. I, you mean my voice? You yeah. How about you, Tay? Do you hear me? Well, yeah, yeah, I can hear Tay fine. How about you, Tay? Do you hear me fine? I hear you fine, just maybe slightly less volume than the, the start, but it should be fine. Well, I'll try to speak louder because I don't know how to, to do anything with my computer. <laughs> but yeah. uh, let's, uh, my question is, mm -hmm. so you talked about kind of a, kind of a holistic um, vision mm -hmm. of all of the different cycles within mm -hmm. our, 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 our Earth uh, system. Yep. Yep. Now, is that, but I wanted, I wanted to just uh, clarify is you said that that's central is what about the, the question of heat? What brought me mostly to you was this astonishing idea of heat accumulation in, 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 in our pr present predicament, because I remember one of your presentations saying that, well, for example, carbon dioxide accumulation is something that we have to worry about, but in fact, we don't have to worry about it today. We have to worry about it in, in, in you know, like tens or hundreds of years, whereas for his toxicity, uh, from a toxicity point, standpoint. However, 
the thermal, the, 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 the heat absorb uh, uh, increase is very, very, very dangerous and very, very close to something that is uh, uh, catastrophic. In fact, I just saw an article today that indicated that in fact, they have now done some uh, uh, very important research showing that actually plants after they have their own or biotopes, they have their own heat levels uh, that are much, uh, their normal heat functioning levels, plants for photosynthesis are much actually much lower than they expected. And that actually, if we increase our, our, our temperature levels a, a little bit, a lot of plants will cease to be able to function photosynthetically However, they will continue in respiration. In other words, they will continue to, uh, to function and they will actually contribute carbon dioxide instead of pulling it in. And that is their recent, recent information shows that that is actually something that is very worrying for just even a small amount of heating of the planet. So this is like another whammy that I didn't even know existed it seems to be in our future. So the question of heating, is that uh, central to your holistic night different cycles uh, question? Yeah, it's a very good uh, question. So heat is just uh, the accumulation of uh, heat. It's just one example of the more general uh, paradigm. You can conceptualize heat as one waste, which is accumulating. So the unbalanced thermal cycle is one example of, uh, of accumulation. Of and uh, but there are many, obviously many other in the system, uh, CO2 being one and methane being one of the most uh, commonly known. Uh, but we conceptualize heat as just one of them. And uh, we're trying to develop technologies or approaches that enables you know, tuning the source rates and sink rates for each of these uh, uh, you know, problematic species or entities. Uh, so uh, our project is uh, to develop the, the tools um, to enable at least that we have the handle to address them. Um, but obviously um, uh, the other part is to reroute, reconnect the pipes, uh, the plumbing, right? Of the different uh, um, material and energy uh, loops. And uh, in order to um, enable that would be like the work of say Roger and people working on uh, social restructuring to, uh, yeah, so we are providing the energy, uh, the tools. Like in one of our presentations, we tend to classify the universe into just three categories of things. There's the matter, like um, uh, water, air, um, uh, soil. There's the energy, like photons, electrical energy, kinetic energy. Then there's information. Information are physical laws that dictates how the systems a component interacted with each other. But information also includes in this context, uh, laws made by governments and our value systems that dictates how human as an actor in the system decides to channel different resources to different uh, uh, loops and locations. So uh, heat is indeed central. It's a, even though it's like a one example of how the whole system is, is broken. Uh, it is in fact the number one threat that's uh, confronting humanity because of the exquisite thermal sensitivity of all forms of life uh, on this planet that evolved um, within a rather uh, you know, comfortable or fixed range of uh, natural fluctuations. So uh, there's a lot of uh, studies measuring um, the impact of even sustained warming of one to two uh, degree Celsius ab above historical, you know, norms, and um, it's uniform uh, reduction in fitness, uh, in fertility, and the longevity for uh, length, uh, plant species, for example. So you are right, uh, but in saying that, um, um, with uh, the current rate of warming and even at current levels of warming, uh, the capacity for trees and all the plants to uh, photosynthesize and perform a primary production. Uh, to support, uh, you know, us with nutritional energy, or to perform the complementary role of slowly uh, uh, stabilizing CO2, would be uh, drastically uh, reduced and jeopardized. So, if we don't confront heat as the dominant uh, physical parameter that's um, uh, all, uh, modulating the efficiency of the whole Earth system, then uh, all the effort are uh, would be uh, wasted. 
you mean for you, that's that's number one right now. Uh, I wouldn't say it's from, uh, I'm speaking by summarizing uh, hundreds of, and thousands of literature papers done by colleagues in different fields in ecology and uh, um, it, it's difficult to find a counter example of where uh, heating of more than two or three degrees at least to improved uh, uh, performance in life for, for life forms. So, so of, yeah. you know, to so we're um, we're dealing with heat. So what's the plan? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the plan is to um, so um, in our conceptual framework, we can uh, we can uh, think of heat as uh, trapped in in a box. So it, uh, let's say it's a heat on Earth is uh, conceptualized as some stuff in a box. It comes in uh, with uh, via the sunlight. Uh, which are shortwave electromagnetic radiations. And uh, it flows out uh, as long wave um, infrared electromagnetic ra radiations uh, of between say 10 to like 50 microns. On the inlet side, they're roughly say 300 nanometers to 2.5 micrometers. So these two uh, are essentially the same thing, only they're at different color or different wavelength, if you will. Um, and that has, you know, uh, implications for how they are or are not transparent uh, within the Earth's atmosphere. So traditionally, we have been trying to, you know, increase the rate at which uh, the long wave IR is escaping Earth. So if uh, there's a huge leak in your bottle or something, then the, the total liquid or total stuff in the box will decrease, right? So that has been the traditional approach. And the way people are proposing to do that is to uh, filter the air and oceans and reduce uh, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere so that the atmosphere will be more transparent so more of the IR can leak out. Uh, the problem is that are several fold. Uh, one is that uh, uh, it's extremely energetically uh, expensive to um, all mix the air. So once we let you know your exhaust gas into the atmosphere th that those gas escape into huge uh, volume. So they're free. So in nature, there's this thing called a maximization of entropy. So maximization of disorder. So uh, imagine you mix uh, two uh, uh, you know, cups of sand of different colors. Uh, imagine the effort that's required to then sort them out uh, into the black sand pile and the white sand pile when the whole thing is mixed homogeneously. That's what happens at, at, in the atmosphere. So that's obviously very, um, um, energetically costly. P perhaps in a later episode or something, we can explain exactly why uh, it's certain, just uh, physically impossible for humanity to come up with the amount of energy uh, needed, let alone the infrastructure to un undo that process. So roughly, I would just give a number anyways, uh, let's say we want to reduce um, CO2 levels from uh, in the atmosphere to 350 ppm, which is a number which is uh, often quoted we're looking at um, more than six months of the global total primary energy consumption, um, just uh, from a fundamental physics on paper point of view. But the uh, efficiency with which we can do that is very poor, maybe five to 10%. Uh, so roughly we need to spend 10 years, a decade of the world's total primary energy consumption to bring CO2 back to, uh, uh, safe levels. Um, but obviously, it's not possible to just spend all of energy for CO2 capture because otherwise people will, will starve. And what's a, you know, a sensible level of energy uh, to spend for that process? Let's say use the US military as, a, as, an, as an example. Uh, it, for the US military, it will take, um, I think, roughly uh, several thousand years to accomplish uh, the process. So if we can form a UN-based uh, CO2 cleaning uh, task force, the size of the US military, we're looking at uh, millennia to reverse the process. Um, so even if that was priority number one, uh, topping everything else and we do nothing else um, besides doing a CO, uh, CO2 capture, we're looking at centuries. That, can I just ask though, is that, um, is there, an issue there of technological efficiency in so much as 
some infrastructure would be more effective than other. You know, like my understanding is you have to suck the air in for the sake of argument, and then you take the CO2 out, and then that process involves an enormous amount of energy, as you just alluded to. Mm -hmm. So, but, you know, usually with technologies, they start off quite inefficient and then they become more efficient. And so is, is there an argument, and you know, I have no idea, so I'm just, <laughs> it's an open question. Is there an argument that if these sucking machines, as you might call them, are more efficient in their technological design, then they could take the CO2 out of the atmosphere with less energy than you've just discussed? Or is it more... Is there some law of physics involved? I, I don't know. Yeah, that's an excellent question, uh, Roger. So um, there are two parts to this. Yes, uh, technology can become a bit more efficient, but not by a, a factor of tenfold that would be required. The reason being, there is a fundamental uh, energy that must be sur surmounted. So uh, imagine you, we have a uh, clean air, uh, clean air and the CO2 in separate bottles. Their total you know, free energy would be, say, at this level. When you mix them, their free energy uh, de decreases. Uh, just imagine, uh, I'm uh, uh, conceptually representing, say, just imagine some water uh, on the hill and water going down. So in that uh, flowing down process, there's energy, gravitational energy, which is lost. And to undo that process, you need to uh, intrinsic a fundamental input of energy that you cannot avoid. The same thing goes uh, for the mixing process from a high energy unmixed pure state to a mixed entropic homogeneous mixed state. There's a um, intrinsic uh, you know, loss of uh, free energy in the process. And that energy is the more than half year of the world's total primary energy consumption uh, that I was uh, referring to. So what you're saying is that there's a fundamental physiological limit to the efficiency because, because, because the actuality of separating these two things out has an intrinsic cost that, that no technology that is going to overcome. Although there could be marginal improvements in the technology, um, the fundamental physics predicts that there's a fundamental amount of energy that's required and what you're saying is that that amount of energy is 10 years of the total energy the human race produces. And that's obviously um, something that's not at all practical because, of, as you said, well, obviously in an absolute sense, everyone will starve, but like... Three, we are now recording. Okay. Yeah, great. Well, welcome back. <laughs> yeah, so, welcome. yeah, we were just um, establishing what, my understanding is your view that there's a fundamental limitation mm -hmm. to the efficiency of sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere because of the yeah. basic physics. Yeah, so the, um, yeah. Uh, the fundamental energy, uh, assuming like 100% um, capture efficiency, no energy loss uh, whatsoever, uh, we still need to invest um, uh, roughly like half year or more of the world's total energy consumption uh, for this process. And uh, just to put that into perspective, it's roughly um, 150 years of energy expenditure by the US military. So let's say in the uh, most uh, optimistic case that we were to you know, up, uh, uh, scale up the US military uh, globally to 10 times its size and devote it just for this purpose, then it would take us uh, 15 years uh, for the task. But uh, we have to remember that uh, it, that's also assuming uh, the energy used in this process is entirely renewable and generates no further uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, that goes all uh, for the, all future uh, global energy consumption. Um, but the problem is uh, we barely have enough, we certainly do not have enough uh, established uh, um, injection sites or places where it can store that captured CO2. So how can we consider Pull, pulling uh, things out from the atmosphere, we don't even have enough uh, sites to store the, the one generated to run that capture process. So um, am I right in thinking, sorry, I'm not an expert, you know, this is a bit of a basic question, but 
when Bill Gates and these various other people have these machines to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere, so I understand the principle that, you know, you can suck it out, but what you're saying is it takes an enormous amount of energy. And then the second problem is the CO2 material, as you might say, is still in existence in, in, in that form. Uh, it doesn't, it's not converted to another chemical. And in so much as it's not then, it has to be put under the ground so that it doesn't escape into the atmosphere and create more global warming. And I, my understanding is there are places <coughs> that you can store it underneath the ground, but it's quite geologically rare or at least limited. Um, and uh, so that's that's a second limiting problem, I, I presume, given that you could have an enormous amount of this stuff, presumably. <laughs> yeah, so I think uh, in a lot of these technologies, they work in principle, but the devil is in the scaling. Right. And uh, once you scale, you often find many of the technologies, one, either we don't have enough uh, global reserve for the process. I examples include uh, uh, assisted uh, you know, carbonation of CO2 using olivine, for example. We, don't, we have maybe megaton, maybe a few gigaton reserve, but we're looking at uh, tens of gigaton per year. So how are we going to manage that beyond the first uh, a few demonstration projects? Sorry, which, which, which idea is that again? Olivine. Olivine. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's, it's a mineral nest, isn't it? It's a mineral yep. that actually binds uh, carbon dioxide, transforms it or something like this, that's probably just naturally, just exposed. All oh, right. Yeah. But so, then you have to store that somewhere, did you say? Well, they want to spread it around and then it sort of fixes CO2. Well, tell me, yay, are there, there's obviously also a future for different technologies, some that don't exist yet. You, you might even have some in your imagination that haven't been explored that might have some maybe better numbers or better potentials than what we have at, at our present stage. Do you think that there's a future of what you know about chemistry, what you know about physics? Do you think that there's like fundamental problems or do you think that some, some solutions may occur down the road, but at this moment, it's just as you described, basically off the table as far as accounting goes, it just doesn't work. Uh, so it, the, the figure of uh, 150 years of US military primary con energy consumption, that's uh, as uh, efficient as it could get in theory. Oh, Maybe some, maybe some alien technology. <laughs> okay. But even, I, I don't think so. If aliens exist in this universe, they're, they they're, uh, you know, uh, have to abide by the laws of physics of this universe. Okay, so uh, you don't so, see any kind of like tweaks in future where there'll be like some more streamlined versions of, of the processes um, for carbon capture that could be, I don't know, somehow automatically self-sustaining using some sort of process we haven't quite yet figured out? Uh, no, I mean, it doesn't matter. Even if we went to the most uh, optimal case, 15 years, the system, it's a question of whether it can handle 15 years. Yeah. Okay. At the current rate of warming. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Right. So at, at the present, so you, do you want to sort of like bring the, the, the focus of the question rather than, to, than um, carbon sequestration towards heat or let's just call it cooling if you want. You could, you could call it heat reduction or you could call it simply cooling. You know, it depends on how you want to look at it. If I was in um, the desert, you know, it's being beat down by sun, I would obviously put something over myself. I would want something that would reflect the maximum amount of heat off of me just to survive the, the heat of the day. Um, and, uh, you know, there's white, there's different colors, there's different stuff. And when you mentioned in your presentation that I saw the word mirror, it was just like a thing that kind of like, uh, like a bell that hit me on top of the head. Well, of course, you know, everyone knows with infrared radiation, any kind of radiation, any kind of, any kind of radiation, anyway, a mirror is the way to go. You know, people in working in st steel mills, for example, working with steel with great heat, their, their clothes are reflective. You know, there's reflect. It's the only thing that really. So, um, is is that where you you think is the the only accounting possibility is to reflect reflect the the sun 
instead of just like covering ourselves up or painting everything white, but you think we ought to reflect it out. Is that is that your? Uh, yes, and I will explain uh, uh, from a conceptual perspective why that's the case. So we talked about uh, how heat is trapped in this box. And there's only two ways to control how much heat is trapped. One is to open the outlet, as we just discussed, which is uh, energetically prohibitive and uh, temporally inconsistent with uh, the kinetics of, of the problem. So the only alternative from a basic fundamental principle point of view is to shut down the inlet. The and when you do that- the, That's the sun. That's the sun, yes. Just to uh, uh, reduce the amount of uh, 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 solar radiation that gets converted into heat on this planet, how to intercept that process. And uh, uh, the difference between these two, even though they seem symmetric, are not equal from engineering perspective. Why remember that? remember that uh, when we are trying to open the outlet, we need to suck out the air, filter the air. That's a three-dimensional engineering problem because you have to move a, a volumetric air or seawater or through, sea some, through some system, right? It's a three-dimensional uh, challenge. Whereas if we just say put mirror, as you mentioned, uh, on out there uh, in, in wherever on earth there's the sunshine, the mirror is essentially a two-dimensional object. And it's solid and sits there. And it's a sits there, yeah. That's so good. so from a energy cost perspective, uh, that's a much more uh, manageable process from engineering point of view and also easier to, to implement. So you don't have to turn it on, turn it off. It's just there. It's just, it's just as long as it's there, as long as the sun is shining, it's actually doing its job. Correct. So it's a passive device, which is a very uh, good for durability because we don't have to, there's no moving parts if it's well designed engineer wise. So it can sit there for decades, centuries. Uh, now you yeah. say there's no moving parts, but when I imagine a mirror sitting there and I imagine the sun coming up in the morning, I know that the angles are, are kind of incident and that would send a the solar radiation off on another angle, which would have a whole lot more time to be absorbed in our atmosphere as it goes off on that angle. Um, uh, is there uh, the idea that it ought to be always focused into a vertical direction so that the least amount of atmosphere would absorb the radiation reflected? I'm very much impressed by your question. So that's basically a, a bulk of the work uh, by one of our teams. Uh, basically finding what's the optimal angle to tilt the mirror those are installed on land such that when averaged over time, the seasons, the day, that by the end of the year, after we have completed the, the circle around the sun, we get the maximum uh, uh, rejection of heat. Uh, so- Or the least amount of absorption because- ab uh, Yes, only... yes. Absorption, yes, correct. So in other words, you're, taught, you're thinking about actual movable, movable mirrors or uh, that stable mirrors? Uh, stationary mirrors, but with an uh, angle which is adjusted to the different location that there are. Oh, okay, that's for simplicity's sake and for cost. Yes, because there's huge advantage in sacrificing, say, a factor of three in overall efficiency, but you don't have to put a motor or, uh, on every mirror. That's simply not possible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that would be, again, uh, going into the techno fix uh, way of thinking that uh, we can just have a fancy highly efficient uh, device. But sometimes, you know, from engineer's point of view, it's, we'll have to make, you know, compromises. And in this case, it's uh, essentially material availability, durability. When I talked to Roger first about, about you, and I was trying to tell him how groundbreaking or how much uh, the idea blew me over, I meant, uh, he, he came back to me, well, is that like, um, like un unfurling mirrors in space, you know, we've seen some of these ideas, and um, um, and it and it uh, when you imagine something unfurled in space, you imagine a higher efficiency in the process because, well, up there there's no atmosphere and stuff, and you're already you're a hundred percent shielding the mm -hmm. earth and so on and so forth, and of course it's an expensive proposition. I was wondering if you could maybe characterize. Um, the relative uh, advantage or disadvantage of such a process. Because I think a lot of people, when we think about this, 
they think about it installing stuff in space mm -hmm. and the difference. Yes, uh, that's an excellent question. So uh, if you want, uh, you have to, you know, if I have to give a number, it's roughly six times more efficient per uh, area in space versus on land. Ooh, six. Yeah. However, there's a huge cost associated with it. Yeah. The cost is enormous, right? So yeah, you've yeah. got to compare. What you're basically saying is, number one, it has to be at scale. Yeah. And number two is, it has to, like, you have to relate the cost at scale with the benefit at scale, right? That's, Correct, yes. That's the so, basic structural analysis. Have like you that. made the cost benefit analysis? Uh, we haven't done that for that particular technology, but just from first intuition, it's a uh, one that we will certainly perform in the final draft of our manuscript in preparation. Well, look, just from like the back of an envelope, you what would you say? Like that would be like a thousand times more expensive than sticking the mirrors on the earth or a million times more expensive. I tell you what, uh, I have a reason for this question. I'll tell you in a moment. Yeah, <laughs> I'm hesitant to give a quote number that I haven't verified personally. Okay, well, we all agree it's going to be ex hugely expensive, right? Okay, well, uh, let's, let's focus on the... Okay. The more difficult thing, I think, is uh, actually durability and the control. Uh, because right. it's a gigantic space insulation. How are you going to make sure that it's stable up there for millennia? I see. Not millennia, but centuries, let's say. Ah, that's the engineer speaking. I see. Okay, well, the only, the only reason I brought it up is because I'm very worried about the Arctic. And yeah. um, I thought that maybe in such a situation, I think the Arctic, I mean, look, from someone who, who is just talking about uh, the basic uh, uh, earth systems at this point, there are places where uh, installations that reflect sunlight are more useful or have more impact than other places. And we should go into this discussion, but mm -hmm. just about the Arctic, since it's so crucial and so critical, in fact, it might be the place where we have to in put so much of our energy and our money even at this stage, mm -hmm. perhaps, just a question, perhaps such a thing in space over the Arctic would be uh, justified. I have no idea because I just can't wrap my head around the dimensions or, or uh, and such. But for example, a mirror in the Arctic, there would be special problems. It wouldn't work. Snow. I don't know. Uh, oh well, uh, we. I don't think uh, it would be a good uh, idea, or uh, it wouldn't make sense to put mirrors in the Arctic. Uh, first of all, they would be less efficient for balancing the overall. Uh, energy balance on planet Earth. If we just zoomed out and consider what's going in in that black box and what's coming out, it's much more uh, efficient in, um, you know, below uh, say 60 degree um, in, in latitude. And uh, uh, it's intuitive that people would want to directly shield the Arctic from solar radiation. But we have to realize that um, you cannot really stop warm air from moving from the tropics into the Arctic because that's uh, that's how most of the heat is actually transported into the Arctic region. There's uh, uh, by air movement and uh, maybe 10% by ocean currents. So those uh, atmospheric circulations uh, and their role in the distribution of energy on planet Earth once everything is in this black box needs to be taken into account. So, okay, so let's, let's focus on the main job then, as it were, which is, as I understand it, is putting stationary mirrors uh, in tropical areas, broadly speaking, uh, facing the sun at angles which optimize the reflection of the sun into space over the whole year. Uh, and there's a stationary angle for that, which can be like verified, as you might say. Um, so what, I, as I understand it, that's your major proposition. And could you give us some ideas of the cost of that and then relative to the efficiency of it, as you have done with the other examples. Okay, great. Um, so actually this question will lead to where you come in as an experienced farmer. So we, we're not, uh, we don't think it's uh, productive to just uh, for the mirrors to take up land that could be you know, left to nature and the biodiversity recovery. We'd rather use land that's already highly engineered, uh, namely cropland and human agricultural areas and use the mirror not only as a global cooling device, but a local climate mitigation uh, cooling strategy 
to enable the persistence of industrial agriculture, even when the global average temperature is uh, taking a hike. So we have some estimates that suggest to say, if we cover 10% of uh, uh, the agricultural land, we can get uh, order degree um, to two degree uh, Celsius decrease in maximum daylight, uh, daytime temperature. And that would not only uh, provide uh, uh, thermal relief to the, the crops, but also could reduce correspondingly the rate of evaporation from the leaves and uh, alleviating uh, concerns for drought when there is a perturbation to uh, the precipitation patterns. Do you mean that if you put, like let's say Roger's farm, well, he's up a little higher, maybe it should be lower. Imagine Roger's farm down lower somewhere. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that if you put mirrors near the fields, obviously not where he's working on, on the agriculture because it can't, it, it can be next to each other, but it can't be in the same space. Mm -hmm. So it, you mean it locally around the okay. space where you put the mirrors, it actually creates a cooler environment? Yes, correct. And we know that from analysis uh, in cities, when people study the urban heat island effect, uh, if you have a, a, a similar comparable neighborhoods and basically next to each other, one is globally wider than the other, then you can measure several degree uh, of a uh, temperature difference between those neighborhoods. Wow. And uh, well, what's important is that uh, uh, there's something called, say, uh, uh, you know, correlation length or persistence length. Basically, if you have, say, one field covered by mirrors, how, how far does that effect carry? So basically, uh, air movements, et cetera, will help to uh, smear out the uh, temperature difference uh, in the location with mirrors versus not. And that smearing out distance is several hundred meters to maybe half a mile. So, so you can have some local uh, cooling effect, even when say the mirror is not, not directly on top of your crop. Field. Okay, so a, a sort of physical di design for the sake of argument would be you have say strips of land and you'd have a strip of mirrors and then you have a strip of agriculture, you know, of a hundred to 500 meters for the sake of argument. And then you'd have another strip of mirrors. But the, I mean, the, the substantive question, though, is, is you're saying if 10% of agricultural land was covered with these mirrors, did I catch that correctly, that that would reduce global temperatures by a certain amount? I didn't catch what that was. Um, I don't think I mentioned that, but uh, oh. you <laughs> somehow stumbled on almost the right number. Uh, let's say we covered 10% uh, of the currently cultivated land of all types by mirrors, uh, slowly from now until the end of the century, we can roughly keep current uh, weather, weather patterns for the next 80 years. If we uh, somehow went on RCP 4.5 emission pathway. Right, and so we progressively move towards 10%, you're saying? Yes, if we take 80 years for this project. Right, um, okay, and what's the, so we basically maintain temperatures at the present level. Yes. So presumably looking at the distribution curve of risk in terms of feedbacks, we to be more sort of rational, we would want to be reducing the temperature, right? By one uh, degree. Correct, I agree. So initially there would have to be a, a push like a spike in implementation. Right. To basically force down the the CO2 we'll down and the to sort of zero, but pre-industrial, for the sake of argument. Um, so let's say, I mean, my understanding is a rational analysis is uh, pre-industrial will be quite difficult. I, <laughs> that's a <laughs> well, three yeah. fifty, right? The equivalent of three fifty. So what's that? Half a degree, half a degree above pre-industrial. Let's say rather than one point three that it is now. Is that what you're yeah. thinking? Um, so the, the number I quoted is to actually not as ambitious, just to, to stabilize 2020. So it's right. obviously disastrous already, right? There's no argument about that. But uh, in order to have those sort of like half a degree jump, uh, that's a, a, a scenario which would be very difficult to, to undertake uh, from a practical point of view, given where the politics are, where people are with respect to understanding the, the urgency of the issue. Uh, so. But I agree with you. Uh, um, 
you know, in the ideal world, if a uh, you know, but and the Roger were making the laws for uh, the entire. Well, I think we need to separate separate out the social analysis from the physical analysis, right? Okay. So yeah. I think let's look at the physical analysis first of all, because as you rightly said, if, if the physical analysis is beyond, you know, our our the capacity of the human energy system, then then obviously that's an you know even if it's technically possible, it's not going to be physically physically possible. So yeah. so that's the first question, isn't it? So let's just say we're going for maintaining temperatures at you know one to one point three degrees above pre-industrial, right? Mm -hmm. You're saying we need to, a progressive increase in number of mirrors over eighty years uh, to the point that in eighty years, ten percent of the commercial farmland in the world is covered. That's the sort of physics physics maps, as you might say. That's my understanding of what you're saying. So, in so much as you're correct in that then could you just say uh, how much of the Earth's surface that is and then explain a little bit about what the you know, cost in terms of materials and GDP and other, other sort of ways of assessing the physical cost are. And then we could move on to the social and political affordabilities of it, as you might say. So do you want to take those in turn? So how, 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 yeah. how big an area and what sort of cost does this involve? Okay, so before I get started, I want to mention that uh, today we're just focusing on the, the mirror component uh, of uh, our project, uh, uh, Mirror Reflection. And uh, we have you know, several strategies that complement each other. And yeah, when, sure. Yeah, sure. But yeah. let's just say we only had this, uh, this only one uh, uh, solution. Then 10% of um, agricultural land corresponds to about 3% of the Earth's uh, total surface area. So Bud said that's a qu equivalent to uh, Peru. Not that we're trying to do to have anything against Peru, but um, um, can you give an idea of what 3% looks no, like? No, I think that's actually uh, much, much larger than Peru. Yeah, I was going to uh, say. It's much, much, much larger. Yeah, uh, so 3% th of Earth's surface area uh, is basically taking uh, the Sahara Desert, uh, the desert in Asia, and uh, parts of a uh, uh, small part of American uh, West, and uh, a big chunk of uh, uh, Australia, where it's a, yeah. So and it's a, it's a gigantic. All those, all those areas being covered with mirrors. That's huge. At, at yes. the end of the process. At the end of the process, yeah. Can you tell me why you chose to, to, to think of the, of the desert in um, the reason I, I mentioned it is because a little while ago, we were talking about the benefits of interspersing mirrors with croplands, I guess, in really uh, heat um, 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 stressed agricultural regions. And that's becoming a, a real serious problem today. We can think of India, mm -hmm. we can think of the American West, we can think of lots of areas that are really heat stressed, whereas the mirrors would actually be very beneficial Whereas yes. if we speak about the Australian outback or the Sahara Desert, that doesn't bring any benefit to agriculture, but obviously, yeah, so I understand. Yeah, I think that the re, uh, using those examples is basically from when I carefully did uh, the, the first round of uh, assessment. So I uh, actually measured the size of those areas. So okay. uh, if I have to go back, probably I would choose uh, another you know, just one piece of, of oh, okay. different countries. So, okay, that's... so if you're saying in 80 years' time, 3% of the Earth's surface is covered by mirrors, what's the material and financial cost of that? And is it your opinion that that's that, you know, how difficult is that to achieve on a, on a physical level in your mm -hmm. view? Yeah, so um, the mirrors that are one would use are mostly made of, uh, say, glass. And uh, the main components in glass are silicon and oxygen. These are the top two most abundant uh, elements in the Earth's crust. Um, so for example, molten sand uh, or uh, molten rocks, we can melt them into whatever shape. And then when they solidify, they will be pretty good uh, structural materials. So uh, the good thing about uh, glass making is that uh, it's a more or less one step process. Uh, the, and only the main ingredient is heat. And this is uh, 
a very different for all the other say structural metals that we're dealing with where there's uh, electrochemical reduction steps or um, charcoal induced uh, reduction steps. Uh, in the case of glass, it's just heat. So that makes uh, the process uh, uh, simple to scale up and also potentially compatible with the solar uh, thermal energy processing. Uh, if somehow we can just harness uh, the solar light using concentrating uh, furnaces, we can potentially use mirrors to reproduce themselves, at least uh, from an energy capturing uh, point of view. So um, if I have to give a number, uh, um, if we want to install just one mirror, wh whatever the, the quality today, that offsets one ton of CO2 uh, warming, we're looking at roughly $10 uh, of a uh, mirror that you can buy from alibaba.com. Yeah. Ali, you can buy this. Okay, so mirror scale well. that up then. So what yeah. are we looking at in... It's a size, it's roughly uh, okay, one ton, and we're looking at four feet. Three, it's a three, three by three meter. Yeah. Roughly, I think. Yeah. So, what's scale that up then to 3% of the Earth's surface? What are we looking at in terms of cost? Is that uh, the analysis you're doing? You're saying like, Say yeah, it's been a while since I visited all those numbers, but uh, <laughs> this is the number we want. <laughs> uh, I can get back to you uh, the exact number. Like, it's uh, all late in the day. I don't want to make a you know yeah, yeah, well, that uh, a factor of ten or twenty or or hundred. Like a, difference. a bit like a drama where you're waiting for the the final the final score, and then you have to wait to the next episode. Uh, but um, seriously speaking, I mean, I think what you've established uh, is is that the technological process is reasonably straightforward and replicable. The physical inputs are uh, uh, abundant. So those are two limiting factors. And the third limiting factor is, is how much of human labor stroke finance is going to be required to do it. And, and that's the question where we're sort of interested in. I mean, would you, could you sort of give us, I mean, presumably you think this is a, is a, is, you know, in a climate emergency social context, let's put it like that. Um, it's something that society could afford to do without, you know, completely destroying itself, as you might say, I not having enough time to do anything else. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what's your sense of that? Or do you need to go off and get your figure and tell us next session? Uh, so uh, I did a quick, uh, uh, you know, calculation. Uh, so if we really wanted to, you know, over 80 years cover 3% of Earth's surface. Uh, we're looking at roughly uh, uh, on the order of 10 trillion uh, if we were to buy the mirrors commercially. <coughs> 10 trillion, that's, uh, that's doable. Um, so it's not a question of money. I mean, right now we're, we're doing 10 trillion, the world is doing 10 trillion just to deal with uh, the, the, the pandemic and the lockdowns. Yep. Um, but um, actual logistically, is this something that could only be really done on a multilateral thing? Like you just basically have every country sort of pitch in and say, okay, now you have to take so much of your industrial uh, you know, processes and devote them to just producing on this model system. Everyone's sort of like, all of the nations have to somehow cooperate on a, on a kind of you know, well-organized well system to work together to do all this production and installation. Is it something that would clearly, the size of it would clearly have to be totally multinational. It couldn't be just done by, let's say, the Chinese or just the Americans or just the, the UK, for example. I mean, it's, it's obviously something that goes beyond any one country. It has to be a complete global thing, right? Uh, correct. And especially it would be uh, useful to involve China, the manufacturing uh, powerhouse in the process. Um, and with uh, the coordination and planning that's required, I think it ha would have to be yeah. international effort. So can I just check? Um, so you've got this 10 trillion, you know, but that's just the primary cost. You've also got the cost of transport and installation, right? Correct. On top of that. Yeah. So you could be looking at another half or something, let's say, for the sake of argument. I don't know. So you yeah, might that's, be... uh, that's also beyond my uh, expertise. Yeah. So I, I would well, be reluctant to, to... That's obviously something... 
And in t just to come back to the primary materials, you were saying it's silicon and oxygen, right, and heat. Um, mostly, mostly. There is uh, a trace uh, amount of uh, aluminum and magnesium and calcium just from impurities. And are the trace elements sort of relative to the size of the project? Are there any li other limiting material inputs that make this problematic at 3% of the Earth's surface? Uh, no, because uh, all the elements in uh, you know, soda lime glass actually are the top five or six most abundant elements in the Earth's crust. And, and presumably, does that, I mean, presumably you're looking at some sort of frame, right? Uh, I mean, what's the major main engineering scenario? Just, just so I've got it in my head is, is you've got the mirrors. And so, I mean, are you looking, have you got an idea what the optimal size of the mirror is? Or is that not so important? But presumably it needs a frame. And at that scale, the frame's going to have materials in as well. So is, is there a limiting factor on the, mater the subsidiary materials other than the mirror itself? The supporting material would also have to be made of glass. Right. Uh, okay. Just due to the scale of the thing. And uh, it would be possible, I think, to make a glass uh, post or rods. Exactly how in 3D the assembly uh, will be done, that's an uh, open question. Right, OK. OK. I'm intrigued, by, I'm intrigued by the idea of it being uh, um, produced kind of locally at this on sort of on site or at least regionally where there's a lot of sun. You talked about using uh, a furnace made from mirrors that the production system would be occurring at a place where it wouldn't so things wouldn't have to travel as far things would be sort of built up from the sand in the desert that's melted and turned into mirrors and then distributed kind of nearby. Is that sort of the general idea of what you're thinking? Uh, not for the mirror production part, I think, because um, if we want to make it, we want to make it a high quality that will last for on the order of century, uh, even without much maintenance. Um, and for such a standardization of quality, I think uh, a lot of R&D and the centralized facilities can do it much um, more efficiently and much better. Okay, so then and where, where it's yeah. very important. Yeah, it's very important to point out that uh, even if we were to power the manufacturing process by fossil fuels, we are only you know uh, uh, only like five percent of the CO two that a mirror can offset would be uh, corresponding to the fossil fuel burnt for its own making. That means uh, there's no uh, problem to use uh, fossil fuel energy to power the mirror manufacturing process for the scheme to be still viable. Okay, okay. Well, we've got um, three minutes on this Zoom call, so oh, you can do that. Good. should we pop off and just come back on just to do the final comments? Yeah. Um, okay with you? And, then, and then, you know, we'll, we'll discuss how we're gonna get the world to get its head screwed on and get on with the job, right? <laughs> <laughs> you guys okay with that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's go off now. So we're doing an ordered way, and then yeah, so do you'll, have... you'll just email a new link. Is that right? Yep. Straight okay. away. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. See you in a minute. But I, I was wondering about, I was wondering before, I mean, I agree with you, Roger, that, you know, it's probably um, um, good to, you know, to be able to even just like provide this so that the, it's kind of spontaneous and people can feel about it, but in to find a way to wrap up and then maybe sort of program something a little, uh, um, maybe a little coherent for the future of it. I was just wondering though, shouldn't we uh, ask Yay? because I, I sense a sort of a frustration. We're talking about this one thing about the mirrors, and yet I have a sensation that underneath Ye's vision is is much. Uh, well, he talked about it as being kind of con uh, contextually a lot a lot bigger. Like more, there's these components that m that might synergistically make the vision. How many times more? Uh, potentialized, I don't know if that's a word, than what we're just thinking about with the mirrors. You know what I'm saying? I was wondering uh, if, yay, do you think that it's too much to go into at this stage or do you want to somehow uh, uh, introduce it or or bring it into the into the picture, the, uh, the question of the other elements? Because we have a very narrow vision at this moment. Um, uh, yes, indeed. Uh, and uh... Probably the other projects also deserve uh, discussion 
um, of the same like you know detail as we have done for for the mirrors. But the general idea is that uh, we certainly cannot just you know think uh, mirror or whatever uh, to be the panacea of the situation. We certainly need to decarbonize, and the mirror is just one a tool that uh, help us first of all give us time and also provides uh, alternative means to harness energy, for example, to make certain solar energies cheaper if we can also use mirrors in those applications. So it's just that uh, gives impetus for the transition uh, for, decarbon for decarbonizing. But to the general framework of the project, uh, trying to close all the open loops and open cycles and uh, uh, re-channel re where the materials are going, that can be uh, applied more broadly. And we can think of, of about uh, cooperating with nature to capture you know, CO2 eventually back most uh, effectively in, in a form which is say easiest and most amen amenable to storage. Um, Would you say that to bring CO2 out of the, uh, the atmosphere, whether it's the atmosphere or the water is an extremely expensive and complicated affair because you have to have all this three-dimensional flow of matter right yes so. yes so we, that's that's correct so we don't want to just uh, capture co2 for the sake of capturing it using some specifically designed technology that performs no function other than to do this expensive process but if we can say in one of our uh, component projects we're looking at uh, cooperating with the uh, marine bivalves oysters and the clams and um, like uh, help those guys help us uh, uh, capture CO2 into a form which is much more stable, basically limestone, which is also easier to store and sequester safely over longer periods of time. Um, you so, mean become a clam farmer or something, because clams pull out CO2 from from the carbon from the water. They pull it out, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how what they make themselves out of, right? Uh, correctly, yes. And um, so the uh, if we did it in cooperation with nature, then there is a component of nutritional gain and potentially uh, profitable for the farmer, which helps to power the process. So it uh, doesn't, you know, uh, so we wouldn't entirely rely on government, uh, you know, a carbon tax to, to, to fund such a expensive uh, infrastructure for the sole purpose of capturing uh, CO2. If we can are you, couple, are you talking about just like doing more more farming of of mussels and clams and such, or you're just uh, like somehow to like help them pop do more? Is that what you're saying? Yes, we should uh, you know consider you know um, uh, at least a partially transition to uh, these uh, organisms as our protein source, for example. Oh. Uh, if we did that to substantially say, uh, our calculations show. Uh, the amount of emissions we can offset roughly scales as um, uh, what percentage of our calorie intake they contribute to, to within a factor of two. So if you ate uh, uh, clams and uh, oysters and the scallop, say one day per week, uh, you can roughly uh, provide it, you know, we did something with the shell, which we, will, we might discuss later, uh, offset 10% of the uh, CO2 emissions. So uh, on a very basic level, if you ate clams, you didn't eat beef or eat other products that requires land agriculture. So the energy investment in that calorie would be partially uh, uh, be, you know, balanced out. So what you're saying is that uh, in or for the climate, the more uh, seashelled uh, stuff you eat, you actually are um, contributing to removing CO2 from, well, the atmosphere ocean, because the protein of the clam uh, is what it is. It's not a lot, but the clam itself, the shell, is just pure uh, uh, calcium. Calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate, which is yep. a concentration of the thing that's uh, really yeah. bothering us. Correct. Yes. Jesus. And uh, yeah, so, but the major component, of course, uh, is basically, as you say, embodied in the solid carbon that, that's a byproduct uh, of the, the industry, which is considered as a waste. So if we can somehow, you know, you can uh, just bury that, and that's a, a net transfer of carbon from the environment into the burial site of limestone. Uh, that's large. 
so I mean, what, I, what you're saying in a general terms is you've got the mirror technology, right? Which, mm -hmm. you know, is going to cost these 10 tr trillion and we're looking at an 80 year project and we've got the materials for it. And then we have to combine that with the development of natural, using natural processes to take carbon out of the atmosphere, such as the clams example. And I think there's a, there's a bunch of, of ways in which nature can do that. So it's not like either or, of course, it's like a combination. Correct. And I think, I, I think, you know, maybe we can go into this more in another session, but I think to finish off this session, we should be sort of, well, what I would like to acknowledge is the big elephant in the room is the political will as the euphemism goes. And, um, um, what, you know, and I think what Bud was saying is sort of alluding to this is, is this is going to require um, a, a major investment, right? Which needs to be politically uh, enabled, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, as far as I can see, the amount of research that's going into this sort of area is minuscule compared with what it should be. And uh, so that's the step one. And then step two is there needs to be some social state or state facilitated mechanism through which you're going to have this mass production process, right? For the next 80 years. I mean, this is a massive undertaking, isn't it? <laughs> There's no two ways about it. Uh, yeah. And it's going to require putting aside, you know, putting aside a significant amount of of uh, of gross national product, as you might say. I don't know quite how that one works out, but presumably you're going to have the figures thing. But you know, if you're producing something over eight years of ten trillion pounds, I don't know if that's you know how much of uh, how much of global GDP needs to be diverted into. I know it's a little bit of a rough a rough way of looking at it, but it'd be an interesting idea. And I think like if if the research has been done, then obviously for a party like Burning Pink or another sort of what I would call a post-carbon political party, you know, these are the things which are on, you know, these are the things which constitute a programme, right, to, to say this is the way out, you know, we're going to have to decarbonise and invest in mirrors and invest in these processes and we need a transition that's socially just and you know, is socially democratic, as it were. And that's what I would see as the main platform for constructive politics over the next two decades. I mean, is that right? Um, yeah, that, that's <laughs> correct. It would, ha would have to be uh, uh, coordinated and recognized, especially discussed as, an, uh, uh, as a, a potential candidate. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, the funding, I like to come back to, to, to the funding. If we consider the agricultural industry globally, it's like several 3% of a global GDP. So that comes out to like two or three trillion per year. Now, if uh, in implementation safeguards, say just a lower limit, 10% of the yield that otherwise would have been lost, then we are looking at 100 or 200 billion of uh, saving uh, from that, and that's scaled over to 80 years of implementation, basically pays for itself. So, yeah. uh, so the agricultural industry uh, should consider this because, in the end, it's a uh, it's a net uh, just almost self financed thing. Uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, and, and um, of course, <laughs> this is where the sort of social science of of uh, collective action comes in, which of, often scientists, being ultra rationalists, don't get, which is. <laughs> which is there's a fundamental flaw in, in the provision of human rationality, which is called the collective action problem, which is what's collective, what's rational on a collective level isn't rational on an individual level or in mm -hmm. a part of a system. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is what I see as, you know, and there's nothing you know, unique about this, but, you know, the fundamental, as I see it, the fundamental uh, I mean, there's two threats to human existence. One's whether we've left it too late. And what you've said in this presentation is we haven't, it's not too late, but only if we engage in a collective rational project, right? So then the next question is, 
are we left it too late instruments as human beings are capable of, of solving the collective action problem broadly defined which is we all need to come together and engage in costs now to make savings later right yeah. which is you know one of the basic psychology questions of human development isn't it when i don't know if you give a child a, a sweet and say you'll get free more if you don't eat it in the next 10 minutes mm -hmm. and uh, some children do and some children don't and in that sort of experiment you know that's like a sort of prototype of the human ability to survive so um you know I, I i'm not i'm just sort of rounding up the discussion really because as i see it that obviously that's not your remit is to come up with the goods and the remit for people in the social sphere is to come up with the with the collective mechanisms of of uh, making sure this happens and i suppose in that respect you know mass civil disobedience is a well-established mechanism to overcome the collective action problem because it's where a few people in society tell the whole of society to do something sensible. And I mean, civil disobedience could be used, of course, for all sorts of dysfunctional reasons as well. But in terms of overcoming that problem, you know, um, it, it makes me feel like it's even more all systems go, right, to change our politics, to, cr to create that political will that mm -hmm. guys like you are going to rely on, right? Because you can have the most beautiful, you know, conglomerate system in the world, but unless it's going to get enacted, as we all know, then it's all pie in the sky. So um, that's the thought that I'm, I'm having, having heard you. But I'm glad that someone's saying that it's not technologically over, because obviously, if it is, no amount of human political will is going to save us. But it sounds like what you're saying is if the political will is there, then we can construct a, an escape route from what appears to be our predicament. Is that what you're saying? Just to sum up. Yeah, I think the, um, the route uh, is there and uh, it's uh, many uh, people with, uh, you know, in technology would think um, that uh, it's not too late, but maybe for different, uh, the wrong reason in, in some, some cases. And I completely agree with Roger that if, uh, you know, we somehow already have a different form of governance, maybe through your efforts or uh, efforts by many other people around the, in their own different, uh, in, working in their own different ways, then would make it easier uh, for uh, uh, technological uh, advances such as these to be uh, hopefully implemented for the collective uh, good. And I think uh, from our front, uh, you know, in addition to developing the concepts and technology that's required, um, I also see an educational role for uh, our project. So I'm happy to, you know, uh, you know, collaborate with um, Bud, for example, and you guys to spread the message more widely, and also to uh, train uh, the engineers and scientists who would be, uh, you know, in the fields uh, optimizing these things, taking measurements, and making sure we have uh, the most um, uh, ecological and the durable mirrors uh, possible. And of course, the end goal is not uh, to, for the current uh, way of uh, how we organize our production and consumption to, to persist. The, the end goal is to uh, completely restructure uh, our system and to one where it's uh, uh, compatible with the uh, persistence of nature and the rebuilding of biodiversity, giving nature the physical conditions, temperatures, uh, moisture, and the CO2 levels that it needs to thrive, given its uh, evolutionary history. And so we ha have to change our role from a consumer and uh, exploiter of nature to one of a steward of nature, helping it uh, regain its former glories and think of smart ways to incorporate our human enterprise into uh, an ecosystem that can, can persist um yeah so yeah 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 so you're overcoming the moral hazard that, that we start through basically <laughs> yeah. yeah it's a it's a the uh the framework is designed with the end goal of you know for this uh, societal transition and how uh, we can uh, leverage our best understanding of uh, of physics and engineering to enable that can I ask you yeah. how how you how your recept how the reception is um, in different spheres to your ideas and the, already the structure? You've done a lot of work because you have a team and you've done a huge amount of thought on it. You've got a real lot of stuff. It's it's a, it's a real system. 
I was wondering if, if it's been already discovered by scientists, people in the climate, politicians, and so on and so forth. And what is the reception? I, yeah. Uh, so right now, um, obviously, we're on, uh, working under a time constraint. And uh, the normal way for a scientist like myself to communicate ideas is through uh, publishing papers in peer-reviewed journals, uh, a process which usually you know, take uh, on average two, one to two years uh, from the time of uh, starting to write your manuscript until it's uh, out uh, in, in public. Uh, I frankly only started to think about uh, these projects maybe 2017-ish. Uh, so it took me about maybe one or two years to more or less have a coherent framework. And so I couldn't uh, just wait for like two or th three more years until the first papers come out. So uh, our, the, the, the route we have taken is rather to communicate uh, at uh, uh, scientific conferences, including meetings of the American Physical Society and also uh, meetings uh, in uh, um, hydrology and also in my field of uh, nanotechnologies. And uh, so the general reception by uh, colleagues in these technical fields has been very uh, enthusiastic. And uh, uh, the, the, we have received a, one uh, a meaningful critique from um, Kevin Tren Trenberth, uh, one of the leading um, climate scientists uh, at a recent me uh, meeting. So one thing we have to watch out for is how um, mirrors might impact uh, hydrological uh, cycles. Uh, but that's something I, uh, after some thought we think is a secondary to the primary um, cooling effect. Um, so overall, it's been uh, uh, well received at uh, uh, you know oral presentations and uh, uh, keynote speeches. Uh, we're working on um, you know uh, writing the manuscripts um, because we're uh, and at the same time trying to teach the students who are on average you know, college seniors, and for many of them, it's their first time doing uh, actual research. Uh, scientific research, and we have high hopes of uh, placing these uh, manuscript into some of the leading journals. So, there you can imagine there's a, <laughs> a learning process, and they are, you know, volunteering, so they have to still do their homework and the finals and etc. So it's a, a little bit slow, unfortunately, on that front. And um, uh, so it remains to be seen, uh, like how the eventual papers would be uh, uh, accepted uh, by the scientific uh, community and. Um, how uh, investors or government uh, workers uh, would respond after you know academic papers are out because I think it's a, uh, important to have um, those papers as an indication of uh, the soundness of uh, the proposals. In order for the whole the whole scientific community to be able to interpret it, debate mm -hmm. it add yep. to it and so forth in order for the yep. whole thing to be robust it's got to be on the academic level d diffused it can't just be you know a couple of lectures a couple of podcasts and so on and so forth you really need that basic groundwork so that it can really be exploited by the scientists throughout the world is that what you're saying correct yes yes and that process unfortunately takes time yeah, I wish I had stuck in science a little longer and I could help you with writing it, uh, but I don't, <laughs> I don't think I can. Yeah. I was wondering- you know, Well, I'm going to have to cough off, but that's no reflection on how fascinating it is. But I, um, I think, yeah, we, I think we've got a good recording here and maybe we share that with a few people. And I will speak to, yeah, we'll, I think it's really interesting and I'm not quite sure what the way forward is in terms of Extinction Rebellion publicizing it or what have you, but I certainly think there'll be a really good uh, enthusiastic sort of reaction to like entering this discussion because it's so central to what needs to happen. And, you know, I, I've got a little idea on my sleeve for a while is bringing together scientists and technocrats and, and activists to sort of create a global alliance to sort of, because at the end of the day, this is all about speed, isn't it? Because every year that goes by, we're, as I understand it, you know, the situation is exponentially more difficult to control. And the, you know, the long tail probabilities become thicker, as you might say. Mm -hmm. So there's no time to waste, is there, without something too dramatic. Um, so I, I, I will talk to some XR colleagues about it, and so will Bert, and uh, let's hope we can take something forward. But I and yeah, and I hope that 
maybe we can create some sort of Zoom conference at some point, you know, to involve a lot more actors other than just scientists and governments. Because, you know, the, as, as I'm sure you know, the XR theory of change, as it were, is if this is going to happen, it's going to have to be a democratic upsurgence in, in countries mm-hmm. to, you know, overcome the, the political entrenched power of the carbon industries mm-hmm. um, and all that stuff. But yeah, so yeah, how, how, do, you, how do you feel about it? So are you, saying, are you saying, Roger, that um, the, uh, the particular, um, the thing that XR has to offer and is consistent with the philosophy that, you, that, that XR embodies is that the citizens um, need to be a real motor of even the conference um, and and the, the the bringing out of not only this one but geoengineering ideas in general. The whole question of like actually taking the problem in our hands, not just on a political level, but that we need to be included pretty much everywhere um, in this discussion process or do you think that or is that what you're saying or that we have to like have a conference with only like scientists around it for a while well i think i think i think we need to do both right but you know i mean what's interesting is you know what what you've said jay um yeah is um you know you're you're a designer you're an engineer of the physical world right and i'm an engineer of the social world and the, you know, the major challenge in the social world is the collective action problem, broadly defined. And the solutions to that are mass de- democratization, citizens' assemblies, civil disobedience. These are the main mechanisms through which uh, you bring about the political will. And of course, a little bit like geoengineering, it's a very small field because no one's really had to worry about it because the system's been, you know, trending along. We haven't dealt, had to deal with an existential crisis, but but uh, as I see it, what we need is, is a connectivity between the scientific community and the citizenry, right? You know, because the citizenry has to be empowered to force the governmental institutions to, to, to engage in rational collective action. And that's a different theory of change than the elite theory of change of you go and give information to the powers that be and through informational transfer they decide it's a good idea because that that method of change has been going on for 30 years and has failed right <laughs> and there, there's good reasons you know there's good social scientific and political scientific reasons why that does fail uh which we you know don't need to go into but you know broadly because of the inequality of power and special interests so i think what 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 i'm trying to say is is this conversation is part of a a broader reconfiguration of how we're going to bring this this to fruition and um i i won't go into the details because we need to stop but i think that's that's our challenge going forward assuming yes. you're right yeah, yeah. And, um you know there is a solution <laughs> which is very good to know <laughs> yeah so you're right that uh, you know we have to bring the information not only to the people in charge but also to the citizens who will be making decisions so yeah. if you want to be a uh, uh, effective uh, democracy, uh, people have to be educated. So that includes about the reality of the crisis, uh, which you have been uh, doing a good job educating, but uh, also the scientific bases for the various uh, proposed solutions so that people can actually rationally distinguish between the various proposals uh, from, with a clear mind. That's a, uh, some something that uh, we would be uh, happy to contribute to. And my group was uh, slowly starting to collaborate with the Open Education Network in the Northeast of the United States to bring um, this mere reflection framework, hopefully to the college campuses in both four-year and two-year institutions, also with the goal of uh, making the knowledge free and uh, freely accessible. And they involve the students and um, uh, as part of uh, developing the solutions and content. And that I think can be done also with uh, activists uh, in different um, uh, groups uh, working towards essentially broadly the same same goal of a societal transformation. And um, um, so I think um, if we can be facilitators uh, in that learning process, uh, that would be a, a good uh, investment of our time as well. I, before before we leave, I, I know we've been on here for a while. I have a question to ask you, Ye. Um, it might be too long, but 
if, I mean, I know you've been living with, with this thing for a few years now. Um, we, I'm speak for myself, I suppose it's something similar maybe for Roger that it's kind of hard for us to kind of get our heads around. So, so complicated the whole thing really is. I was wondering if you could say, if, you know, when you're dreaming, when you're imagining, when you're thinking about it yourself, okay, you know, you're in your, you're having your coffee in your bed and maybe you take three hours thinking about everything that's possible with it, okay, you everything that's possible, okay, there's so many things to deal with, so many things to imagine, and yet there's so many synergies to be created and it could have really, really, I suppose, I mean, I'm just projecting on you, okay, could you give us some sort of, um, some sort of vision of what is literally possible when you are having your, your moments of inspiration inside of your own imagination that is impossible to communicate just in the short amount of time that we have because you have so much to integrate, to, to, uh, sorry, to educate and to explain and so on and so forth. But is there some sort of like basic idea that you could, that you could just sort of uh, um, share with us the real potential of it? I mean, <laughs> you're, you're asking me to, to analyze myself on how I think, essentially. No, so your, your vision, I mean, like the vision, like let's say if I was making a comic book of your uh -huh. vision and I had 20 pages, could I like make with you, with your text and my drawings, a kind of panorama of it and see the whole kind of, you know, earth after the system is implemented from all the details? I mean, obviously that's too much to do. That would probably take you five hours. But is it something that you've already done or something that you could, maybe we should do it another time somehow, but is it something that, because it's so difficult to grasp right now, actually, to be honest. Mm -hmm. with you. Uh, so as far as I understand your question, um, how I, you know, lay out these, uh, the coherent framework, uh, it's through focusing on very specific things often, oftentimes. We really deep, you know, can go very, you know, deep into just the composition of say, say glass uh, and uh, the different, uh, uh, say softening temperatures of different type of glass and how that uh, affect the, the price or energy of production. Um, mm -hmm. So into, in, really into the dirt. And uh, uh, so, and oftentimes, you know, you come up with something that doesn't really work, doesn't fit with the overall uh, picture. So you make tiny advances here and there. Sometimes then you see connection between two points that you try to bring them to close together, see if they complement each other. And so it's a, this iterative process, but uh, uh, to really, you know, make a advance at the cutting edge of science, we really need to be uh, focused and really put your mind to a single task. It's not possible to come up with that whole thing just overnight. And new things appear to you and they continue to, to occur, uh, you know, but uh, um, guided by, you know, a vision of a sustainability for humanity, which we define as the condition when all the different material fluxes are closed, then it's the indefinitely stable loop and we are just stewards to make sure that any deviations from the design flux are corrected for. Okay. I'm sorry, that was a very unfair question. Uh, it's impossible. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's impossible to do it. It's, it's a process and I yeah. have to, uh, we have to wait, you know, and maybe in 80 years time, we'll, we'll know, we'll have a vision of it. Yeah, but I think, I think, yeah, he said, you know, like this is the vision, right? Is, is the sustainability of the cycles, the, you know, the cycles are in balance and, you know, that's a perennial vision of humanity, isn't it? Um, you know, of many different cultures. So maybe that's the, that's the lesson to be, to leave us on really, is that's, that is the, that is the perennial vision of the good life is. Yeah. Cycle of life. Yeah. Or yeah. Death begins <laughs> life. <laughs> so. All right, well, I'm going to have to pop off, uh, okay. but thank you so much, Ye, and uh, yeah, I've got some editors and things, we can put this out on various channels, and then uh, let's have a chat over email or something and see what, what the next steps might be, and uh, yeah. thanks so much, both of you, and thanks for Yeah, thank you, hey. Roger, thank you, bud, for organizing. I also have hey. to uh, jump off. Yeah, sure. Uh, is there anything in particular you want that you want us to uh, think about, or you have a desire for us? We don't want to, to not put you out, or to so it works the best for you in future. Do you want us to think in a certain way before proposing you something? Uh, so basically, uh, if 
we really need a help like uh, uh, illustrating these ideas in a way, visual form or video form that's accessible to uh, the public. So if your network have uh, uh, people with those skills, computer illustration or art artists who would be willing to you know, learn and also then help us illustrate, that would be very helpful. Okay. Uh, and that would also make uh, our task of educating uh, much more efficient and much, and much easier because time is limited and there's only 24 hours in a day and there's uh, more than 24 yeah, yeah. students. Yeah, well, that's certainly <laughs> something we yeah. could we could think about, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, okay. All right. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Yes. good night. Sleep well. See you again. Okay. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye, everyone. Adios.